Right. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for the third session of the series of lectures on the history of Palestine. Um, thank you, Dr. Khalid, once again for holding these lectures. And um, without further ado, let's not delay these lectures, uh, the lecture today. But I would just like to um, give a few announcements. Um, before we start, uh, the film requirement is no longer needed because uh, we couldn't find it online. So no need to watch that film. And um, there will be no quiz today. So I hope no one's <laughs> disheartened by that. But um, inshallah, we'll have some in the following lectures. And yeah, finally, just make sure you um, sign in and get your attendance in through the link that we will send in the comment section. And yeah, inshallah, we can start when you are ready, Dr. Khaled. Yes, inshallah. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Once again, thank you uh, very much uh, for the introduction and uh, thank you to everyone for joining us uh, in this uh, program. Uh, and this is our third uh, class. Inshallah, Azzawajal, over the next uh, 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 today's today's class and next class, we will be talking about the relationship between Prophet Muhammad and the early Sahaba with Bayt al Maqdis. So it's one of the most beloved topics, actually, to myself, uh, to be talking about uh, Al Masjid al Aqsa and the connection of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the early companions with this uh, blessed place, and. To me, this lesson uh, is not just about um, what we are going to learn, but what we are going to do. Because Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, uh, as Allah says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed, the Messenger of Allah is for you a great example, a great model. Uh, so walking on the footsteps of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and trying to implement uh, what I'd like to call the roadmap for the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis. And this roadmap that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam starts uh, uh, with the early companions and today our discussion will only focus on Mecca. Most people think that the connection with Al-Masjid al-Aqsa happened after the night journey. But what we learn today is that this started much earlier than that, and that the connection with Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and the connection with Bayt Al-Maqdis was uh, a very long, outstanding uh, relationship uh, between the early companions and the Prophet وسلم, from the first day of his prophethood. Uh, so we will expand on this and what this actually means and how can we live it today? And my apologies for my uh, voice. I've been uh, for the last three days actually quite sick and um, two days I didn't get out of bed. Uh, but I didn't want to miss out the session or cancel this session because it's uh, uh, the baraka of it, hopefully. Uh, will reach me and yourselves, inshallah, Azza So we are discussing the early connections with Bayt al-Maqdis between the early the, between the Sahaba in Mecca and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam with Al-Masjid al-Aqsa. And as I'm talking, I would like you to think: How can we live these connections today? And I will give you a few uh, tips during our discussion. And then at the end, uh, I'd like to hear what you think uh, could be the way for us to revive our connection with Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in the same way that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam revived uh, this connection in the hearts of the, uh, the Sahaba. <clears throat> so the first connection between the uh, Sahaba and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, we will uh, discuss one, two, three. Uh, uh, many of the uh, Zionist rhetoric today, we hear that Al-Aqsa 
is number three for Muslims and it is number one for Jews. Actually, this uh, rhetoric is uh, full of uh, full of uh, uh, mistakes and uh, and misconception, because to us Al Aqsa is number one, Al Aqsa is number two, and Al Aqsa is one of three. And we will discuss what this actually uh, means in our discussion. But Zionists always uh, try to claim everything. I don't know if you've been following the news of Miss World in in, in the occupied uh, land of Palestine and uh, the beauty, Miss, Wor Miss Worlds have come and under the Zionist occupation uh, of the land of Palestine and they've tried to even steal, uh, at least the Zionists are trying to portray Palestinian culture as, uh, between quotations, uh, Israeli culture. The Palestinian food is uh, sold as uh, Israeli food. Uh, the Palestinian dress, the thawq, the Palestinian uh, famous uh, dress of the uh, fallahin, the, the uh, uh, farmers, the Palestinian farmers, uh, was worn by these uh, individuals as Israeli uh, national dress. Uh, tomorrow they will say the kufiya is uh, an Israeli uh, is an Israeli is part of the Israeli culture. They've done this with the falafel, with the hummus, with everything, trying to claim this to be uh, Israeli. This is this is what happens with when you don't have a culture and you don't have. Uh, a civilization, then you steal from other cultures and other civilizations and try to attempt uh, to call it yours. We said it with the names, the name uh, Or Salim uh, has been hijacked to be uh, Yerushalayim in Hebrew, saying that this is the Jewish name. And we've shown that it is actually an old Canaanite Arabic name before there was even Jews in the world, before the Judaism even started, before Prophet Musa, before uh, Bani Israel, this was the name used by the Canaanite uh, Arabs in that in that region. Uh, but let's uh, get into uh, our our discussion. What is Al Masjid Al Aqsa, and what it, what does it mean? It is number one. It is the first qibla. Uh, of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the early companions even before Mecca. Mecca is the second Qibla. So in a sense here, Baytul Maqdis comes before that. And what does it mean to be the first Qibla? Uh, this is in the early Meccan period, uh, before Prophet Muhammad migrates to Medina and uh, some also uh, part of trying to uh, hijack the history they try to argue, well, Muhammad only prayed towards Jerusalem when he migrated to Medina to appease the Jews and to show them that he is close to them. Muhammad, وسلم, as we will show, prayed towards Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Mecca 13 years before he migrates to Medina and before he meets uh, uh, the Jews in, uh, in, in Medina. But many of you, maybe in your mind, uh, the idea of the Qibla is connected with the five daily prayers. But actually, prayer was ordained, was obligatory on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam immediately after his prophethood. The five daily prayers, yes, the five daily prayers were given to Prophet Muhammad during the night journey. But for 10 years before that, he was praying according to the Quran in the morning and in the evening. And he used to pray uh, for six or seven, sometimes eight hours uh, every night uh, 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 in uh, the night prayer. And this is established and well um, uh, is mentioned in the Quran in the second chapter of the Quran and in the third chapter of the Quran in, in terms of revelation. The first chapter revealed to Prophet Muhammad is chapter Al-Alaq, Iqra, read in the name of your Lord. Uh, the, the first verses uh, tell us. And this, uh, uh, this is in reference to uh, uh, the, 
a first revelation that came down on Prophet Muhammad while he was in the cave of uh, Hira. While the Prophet Muhammad was in the cave of Hira, the, uh, uh, the uh, first revelation uh, after that came to him uh, to stand up and pray. The verses say in Surah Al-Muzzammil and Surah Al-Muddathil, uh, all you wrapped up in garments, stand up and pray. Uh, half of uh, all of the night, except for a portion, half of it or two thirds of it, and the verses continued. Surah Al Muzammil, read the first verses, the first 10 verses. It is a command for prayer. And the Prophet, وسلم, in his prayer, prayed towards the Qibla of earlier prophets, the prophets that we mentioned in our last class, the uh, Prophet Isa, Zakaria, Yahya. Uh, Suleiman Dawood, their Qibla was towards the Masjid Al-Aqsa, and Prophet Muhammad prayed towards the Qibla of the earlier Prophets. You might say, why uh, did he pray towards their same Qibla? Because Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as he says in the Quran, he did not come up with a new religion. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ مَا كُنْتُ بِدَعَمْ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ I was not, uh, and uh, did not come uh, with uh, uh, an innovation of messengers. The Prophet Muhammad was part of a chain of messengers and he is Khatamun Nabiyin. He is the final messenger as uh, is established in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and also in the Quran. Uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, did not come up with prayer. Prayer was already established on the prophets before him. And this is mentioned in the Quran. Even the same uh, form of prayer that we Muslims pray today is the same form that Maryam used to pray. The Quran talks about her sujood and ruku'ah. She used to make prostration and she used to bow down in her salah. Uh, the Quran mentions in relation to Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah says to him, and cleanse my house for those who will make tawaf and those who will make etikaf and those who will make ruku' and sujood in the same form. Uh, <coughs> my apologies. Uh, excuse me again. Uh, the cough hasn't gone away yet. Uh, so the sense of prayer is not something that the Prophet ﷺ established. Indeed, the Prophet ﷺ in a Sahih Hadith, in an authentic Hadith, narrates that we, the messengers, the Prophets, have been commanded to do three things. To delay our suhoor, to hasten our uh, breaking the fast, and to place our right hand over our left hand in salah. Even the uh, placement of the right hand over the left hand, like Muslims do today in their prayers, was not something that Muhammad invented. It was something that was already established. And we know this from hadith, uh, an author that is mentioned, that immediately after the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, becomes a prophet in Ghar Hira, following uh, that, Jibreel comes to him again, and uh, shows him how to make ablution, how to make wudu, and then shows him how to start, how to pray salah. So Jibreel shows the Prophet as the Imam, and Prophet prays behind him, and then immediately the Prophet teaches his household, and he prays the first prayer together with our mother Khadija, and uh, with Ali uh, close to the uh, Kaaba. And uh, the, the, the importance of Al-Aqsa, we will come to the various different connections regarding this. But the idea of prayer has started right from the beginning of the prophethood. It's mentioned, I mentioned in Surah Al-Muddathir and Muzammil. And even the first chapter of the Quran makes mention to Salah with sujood uh, twice uh, in the same chapter. It says, abdan idha salla. Do you not see the one that is trying to uh, stop the, uh, the Prophet while he was praying. And the last verse in Surah Al-Halaq, uh, uh, in Surah Iqra, uh, it says, Kalla la tutahu wasjud Do not obey him and prostrate, 
come down in sujood and come close to Allah. Uh, so the verses, the prayer of the Prophet was not something new. And the prayer of the Muslims today, it is the inheritance of the earlier prophets, starting from Prophet Adam all the way to Muhammad, the form of prayer, the idea of Qibla, all of this is part of the inheritance of the Prophet uh, of Islam. And this is why Islam does not see Muhammad as the first prophet of Islam, but as, as the final messenger of Islam. And all the prophets that came before him came with the message of Islam. The Quran stresses on this and emphasizes this by saying that the disciples of Jesus were Muslims. The children, as uh, Ya'qub uh, was on his deathbed, he called his children and he says to them, his final, uh, final uh, statement, do not die except on the state of Islam. Uh, and Ibrahim says uh, in another verse that he is uh, 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 from the, the Muslimin. And you can see this being repeated that the religion in the deen and Allah is Islam, the religion of Allah is Islam. Sharia may differ, uh, the Sharia of uh, Musa and the Sharia of Isa uh, differ from one another, one another, and Muhammad came with the final Sharia uh, to the religion of uh, Islam. Uh, I know I've talked a bit on this, but the, the, the reason why I'm emphasizing this is uh, because the, the, the way we see Islamic history today is we see it as starting from uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The way the Quran wishes us to see this is that the Muhammad is only the final prophet of Islam, but the religion of Islam is a religion that started way before him. So we will talk about the building of the mosque towards the Masjid al-Aqsa uh, and uh, it being also the center of ascension. This is a very strong spiritual uh, connection with uh, al-Masjid uh, al-Aqsa from that period. What does this actually do? When you are praying towards a Qibla, what does this do to yourself? Today, uh, to Muslims, we pray five times a day towards the Kaaba. This creates an unbreakable bond between Muslims and the Kaaba. This bond, if you ask any Muslim anytime if they would like to go and see the Kaaba, immediately you'll see uh, a, a smile on their face. Those who have seen it would wish to go and see it again. And those who haven't yearned towards seeing the Kaaba. What creates this bond between us today and the Kaaba is this idea of the five daily prayers. We stand every day towards the Kaaba and pray our five daily prayers. And this, uh, as Imam Razi uh, puts it, the Kaaba has become the spiritual hub of the souls of the believers. Every single second uh, in this world, there is a Muslim standing facing towards the Kaaba. From Indonesia uh, to Arabia, to Africa, to Turkey, to Asia, to every part of the world, there is a Muslim somewhere standing up in prayer, facing towards the Kaaba in their prayer, making that spiritual connection between them and uh, that uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, place. So this has become a spiritual hub. What did it? What did it mean for the early Sahaba that the Kaaba is the Al Masjid Al Aqsa is their Qibla? First, before we come to that, we will mention a Hadith. The only Hadith that mentions Al Masjid Al Aqsa as the Qibla is a Hadith with a Sahih Isnad. Uh, it is mentioned by uh, Ibn Abbas. He says the Prophet used to pray towards Bayt al-Maqdis when he was in Mecca. The, the Qibla of Rasulullah وسلم, while he was in Mecca was towards Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, was towards Bayt al-Maqdis. And sometimes the Prophet would place between him and the, the uh, Al-Aqsa the Kaaba. So he would pray south of the Kaaba in order for him uh, to be particularly close to uh, the uh, Aruk al-Yamani, the, the Yamani corner. He would play, pray from there and be able to pray uh, towards the Kaaba and at the same time also pray towards 
al-Masjid al-Aqsa. But this was not always the case. Sometimes the Prophet, when he is in the house of al-Arqam, Ibn Abi al-Arqam praying at night, it is not possible to join both Qibla, so his Qibla is towards Bayt al-Maqdis. Uh, when the Prophet was boycotted for three years in Shab Abi Talib, he was there for three continuous years. It is east of Mecca, so it's impossible to be joining both Qiblas. Also, when he went to Ta'if and when he was outside Mecca, the Qibla of Rasulullah as the uh, uh, only authentic hadith on this issue shows us that his Qibla was towards uh, uh, towards Al Masjid Al Aqsa towards Bayt Al Maqdis. The hadith uh, even mentions uh, the word Bayt uh, Bayt Al Maqdis. Um, this the question comes. We come back to this question: What did this do to the souls and to the arwah of the early Sahaba? How did they become connected to Bayt Al Maqdis? How did they become uh, uh, connected to Al Masjid Al Aqsa? Uh, the answer to this is actually given to us by uh, Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam. Uh, Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam was uh, uh, one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet used to meet uh, Sahaba uh, in his house. The Prophet used to uh, do uh, uh, the night prayers in his house and sometimes in his own in, in his own house. The Prophet ﷺ used to meet with Abu Bakr, with Omar. Omar became Muslim in the house of Al-Arqam. Uh, this is the secret uh, place where they used to meet. Omar ibn Khattab comes, and he was coming to kill the Prophet, to murder the Prophet, and then he <coughs> accepts Islam. On this day that he accepts Islam, he tells the Sahaba, one man can make a big difference. The Islam of Umar ibn Khattab actually made a big difference to the Muslim community in Mecca. They were uh, under a lot of pressure. They were uh, practicing their faith in secret. Uh, uh, a large number of them had to migrate to Abyssinia, to Habasha, uh, because they were not safe in Mecca. They were in a very difficult situation. And uh, Umar ibn Khattab, the day he becomes Muslim, he tells them, why are you hiding? Are we not on the truth? They said, yes, but the people of Mecca will torture us and do this. He said, we should not care. As long as we are on the truth, we will go and make tawaf around the Kaaba. One man made a big difference. Uh, and Umar was the 40th, 40th to accept Islam. He takes the Sahaba and the Prophet Sallallahu and insists we will make tawaf around the Kaaba. And they make the tawaf for the first time together, uh, stating that they are Muslim. And uh, although the people of Mecca have uh, attacked them, however, the early Muslims, the early Sahaba felt a great pride in being Muslim on that day. And on that day, Al-Arqam, Ibn Abi Al-Arqam, comes to the Messenger of Allah and he says to him, O Messenger of Allah, I would like to go to Bayt al-Maqdis. On this day, Al-Arqam narrates, on the day Umar accepts Islam, and he was the 40th to accept Islam, I went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and I said, Ya Rasulullah, inni uridu Bayt al-Maqdis. O Messenger of Allah, I would like to go to Bayt al-Maqdis. I wish I yearn to, towards Bayt al-Maqdis. The Prophet sallallahu asked him, the reason why Meccans go to Bayt al-Maqdis and to Bilad al-Sham, to historical Syria, was for business. Uh, they were merchants. So he said, are you going there for trade? He said, no, I would just like to go and pray in al-Masjid al-Aqsa. This connection, this connection that connected al-Arqam, Ibn Abi al-Arqam, with al-Masjid al-Aqsa, uh, created a very strong spiritual connection between the early Sahaba and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. It created a very strong bond. The way Muslims yearn to, Al to, to the Kaaba today, the Sahaba yearn towards Bayt Al-Maqdis. We pray towards the Kaaba for half an hour or an hour a day. They used to pray for five, six, seven, eight, and nine hours towards Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Do you not expect that they would have this connection? They had this beautiful connection between them and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. 
uh, immediately uh, from the day the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam becomes a prophet, the whole of the Meccan period, and for another 16 months or 18 months in Medina. Uh, I will mention here uh, when uh, the uh, group uh, who made the pledge of Aqaba uh, of Medina, when they accepted Islam uh, in, 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 in Mecca, and they went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and uh, made the first pledge, the first Aqaba pledge, uh, and their number was relatively small. They accepted Islam, and they returned to Medina, to Yathrib. And the Prophet sent uh, for them a teacher to teach them Islam. And the first thing they did was they built the uh, mosque of uh, the mosque of Quba, and they started prayer. And uh, there is a very interesting story I'd like to share with you. It's mentioned in the books of Sahih, in the authentic books of uh, Bukha, uh, in the Sahih Muslim. The narration states that when they uh, returned to Medina uh, and the numbers of Muslims started to increase, they all started praying together towards Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Now they are giving the Kaaba their back because Medina is between. Baytul Maqdis is a third of the way between Baytul Maqdis and Mecca. So they started, the Prophet commanded them to pray towards Al Masjid Al Aqsa. So they started praying towards Al Masjid Al Aqsa. This did not stay just as, uh, 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 just as a direction you put your uh, prayer mat and pray towards it. No, they built the first masjid facing towards uh, Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Actually, even before them, Abu Bakr Siddiq built the first mosque in uh, uh, in Mecca in his courtyard, in the in his house backyard in his garden. He built uh, a small masjid for prayer, and the people of Mecca would uh, sit from their houses, his neighbors, to sit and watch him because he used to cry every time he would stand up in pres uh, in the presence of Allah in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He would cry standing before Allah uh, in his prayer and the women and the children used to weep with him as he was crying. What, make, what would make a, a man, a grown man cry? He would feel the, uh, the greatness of Allah when he would stand uh, in, in, in front of him in prayer. And this is the actual meaning of prayer. Ar in, uh, a prayer in Arabic is salah. And salah comes from the word sila, which means a connection. Uh, and the Prophet Sallallahu said, the closest you are, the closest servant or uh, the, the person is to Allah is when they are in sujood, uh, particularly when one is in prostration, he is the closest to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So uh, coming back to the early uh, Medi Medinian Muslim who accepted Islam and then established the first mosque towards the Masjid Al-Aqsa in Medina, uh, one of the companions, Al-Bara ibn Ma'roor, he said, I cannot give the Kaaba my back. And he says to them, I don't want to pray towards Al-Aqsa. They said, well, the Prophet commanded us to pray towards Al-Aqsa. He said, how can I give the Kaaba my back? We go there for pilgrimage. And they said, well, then we will tell the Prophet, we will pray as the Prophet commanded us. And they prayed towards the Masjid Al-Aqsa, and he's the only one praying in the other direction. And when they, uh, when they come for the second pledge of Aqaba, they complain to the Prophet Wasallam and say, he did not fo follow your command and he prays towards the Kaaba while we all pray towards Al-Aqsa. And the Prophet says to him, Qiblatan law sabarta alayha. It is... The Qibla will change in the future, but you have to be patient. Now you have to pray towards the Masjid Al-Aqsa. So this is an indication. We will discuss this next week uh, when we come to Medina. But the Prophet ﷺ said to him that it, the Qibla will change, but later on, not now. You have to pray towards the Masjid Al-Aqsa. And it is something that already uh, the people of the book, the Jews knew that the Qibla will change as the Quran establishes in Surah Al-Baqarah. Again, we will discuss this later. But what this did to the early Muslims to, in Mecca and to the early, the early uh, uh, Medinian companions, and even to, the, to those, to the hundred Muslims who migrated to Abyssinia, 
they were praying. They built their mosques facing Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, and they continued to pray towards Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Even uh, after the Prophet migrates to Medina, they continued for another eight years to pray towards Al-Masjid uh, Al-Aqsa. Uh, so the idea of this spiritual connection, like we are connected to the Kaaba today, the Sahaba in Abyssinia, in Medina, in Mecca, all of them had this strong spiritual connection with Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in their daily prayers and in their night prayer, even before the, uh, the, before the night journey in the case of the Muslims in Abyssinia and the Muslims in, 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 in Mecca. And uh, the, the Muslims in Medina, uh, they would pray their five daily prayers towards Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, <clears throat> this spiritual connection, how can we revive it today? Is a difficult question, you might say. Uh, Al-Aqsa being the Qibla for the Muslims was not a decision by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الْقِبْلَةَ الَّتِي كُنْتَ عَلَيْهَا We did not uh, prescribe the Qibla which he used to face, except, and then it mentions that, this was uh, 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 a decision by Allah that the Qibla was towards this rock. The picture that you see here in front of you is the rock underneath the dome of the rock, which was the Qibla of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Masjid al-Aqsa, as we mentioned uh, earlier, uh, today for us, uh, Mecca uh, or towards uh, Arabia, Hijaz, we pray. Uh, if we are inside Hijaz, we pray towards Mecca. If we are inside Mecca, then we pray towards the mosque. If we are inside the mosque, then we pray towards the, the, the Kaaba. The same for the Sahaba. They will, they will be facing towards north, towards Asham, Bilad Asham. If they are in Bilad Asham, they would face towards uh, Bayt al-Maqdis, the city. If they are inside Bayt al-Maqdis, then you would face towards al-Masjid al-Aqsa. If you are inside al-Masjid al-Aqsa, then you would face towards this rock. Uh, this is the first Qibla of the Muslims. This uh, sacred rock. Uh, uh, is uh, part of al-Masjid al-Aqsa. And this is why the Muslims established the Dome of the Rock to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to be, uh, to, symbol, to, to remember that this was the first Qibla and the place of the ascension of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let's take questions here. Uh, uh, actually, your comments, not your questions. We'll take the questions later on. But how do you think uh, we can revive this in our hearts today, in our souls today? How can we connect to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa on a daily basis? How can we connect our souls? Uh, the back, you know, when you stand up, when you stood this morning for Fajr prayer, did you consciously think, I am facing towards the Kaaba? Or is it become part of your subconscious? How can we make Al-Aqsa part of our subconscious? How can it become uh, uh, part of our daily routine? That is something that will remind me of Al-Aqsa on a daily basis. What can I do uh, for me uh, to do this? Uh, Anna, can we take uh, uh, some comments on this? Can people... Uh, um, uh, comment on this, uh, if possible. Um, yes, um, I'll read out the comments. Um, someone said to encourage Masjid leaders to talk about Al-Aqsa regularly to make Muslims realize its importance. Very good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, what we're talking about is we want something that we can do on a daily basis, not the message leaders that maybe once a week or once a day, something that you can do on a daily basis that can connect you to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Is the question clear, uh, Anna? Yeah, I, um, I think someone's nailed it. Someone yes. said, you must always make dua. Ah, very good. Uh, this is uh, a very good uh, point. 
that we should make Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa part of our uh, daily uh, dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is something that we should do in uh, a daily basis. It is not something that we remember Al-Aqsa or Bayt Al-Maqdis when there is an occasion or where there is attack or when there is something happening. It should be part of our daily dua on uh, uh, a, a daily, uh, a, a daily, uh, a daily basis. And how do we do this? Uh, how can we include the Masjid al-Aqsa in our du'a? You need to remember that the Masjid al-Aqsa uh, was uh, part. Actually, the uh, Masjid al-Aqsa is uh, in. Uh, is linked to our five daily prayers. Uh, how is it connected to f- for our five daily prayers? Remember when the Prophet Sallallahu ascended to heaven, he ascended to heaven from Bayt al-Maqdis, from al-Masjid al-Aqsa, and came down with a gift to every Muslim. This gift was uh, the gift of prayer, the five daily prayers. And we know that Salah, or namaz or prayer is the ascension mi'rajul mu'min as salatu mi'rajul mu'min is our ascension we can ascend uh, our uruj our mi'raj on a daily basis uh, is actually uh, in our prayer particularly when you are in your sujood so to make a dua uh, for al masjid al aqsa uh, on a daily basis uh, and uh, to make this dua uh, that uh, brother Ferrandi uh, has mentioned. Allahumma uh, rzuqna salatan fil masjid al-aqsa wa huwa hurrun aziz. And this dua actually is uh, an amazing dua. And let us uh, memorize it. Uh, and let us make this dua on a daily uh, basis uh, in our sujood if it's possible or after salah as Pinar uh, has mentioned. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, in your sujood, every day, try to say, to say this dua. And this dua is not just for the ummah or just for al-Masjid al-Aqsa. It is for you personally. And this is what makes this dua actually uh, amazing. Uh, it says, Allahumma rzuqni salatan fil masjid al-aqsa wa huwa hurrun aziz. Oh Allah, grant me a prayer in al-masjid al-aqsa when it is free from occupation. This dua is, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, that Al-Aqsa will be liberated from occupation. This Ummah, this dua is for the Ummah, this Ummah will rise, liberate Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, and Allah will give you a long life to see the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and to pray in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa after it is liberated. To uh, tell you uh, uh, the pain of, and the pain and the joy of praying in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa while it is under occupation. I know for some of you, we all look, look forward to praying in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And for some of you living in Western countries, uh, this is possible. And part of this uh, course, uh, those living within Western countries, uh, a person will be chosen at the end of this course and uh, be sent to uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, but the last time I visited Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa seven years ago, I'd like to tell you my feeling. When I entered the Masjid Al-Aqsa, and this is a place I grew up in, and uh, since my father and my family has been expelled from Al Bayt Al-Maqdis, and uh, my father used to teach inside Al Masjid Al-Aqsa, and we uh, used to join him in his lessons in the uh, under the olive trees of Al Masjid Al-Aqsa and in the classrooms. Uh, seven years ago when I went to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and I made sujood shukr, uh, thanks, uh, sajda of uh, 
praise or thanks to Allah for allowing me to enter in Masjid Al-Aqsa. I made this sujood and I was so happy. I was over the moon. But at the same time, I felt my heart was overjoyed. And at the same time, I felt like a dagger was going through my heart. I felt so happy and at the same time so sad. Uh, I felt pain and joy at the same time. Something I've never experienced in my life. And then I pondered in this euphoria of uh, excitement and happiness, why was I uh, sad and why was I disheartened and why did I feel pain in my heart? And the reason was at the gate of Al Masjid Al Aqsa, there was an armed soldier who decided if I could enter or not enter Al Masjid Al Aqsa. He's the one that makes that decision. And in the morning prayer, in the Fajr prayer, when I went to Al Masjid Al Aqsa, he said to me, Give me your ID. I said, I don't have an ID. He said, Give me your passport. He took my uh, British passport and then he said to me, you can't enter. I said, I'm going to miss my prayer. I'm going to miss Salah. He said, you need to go and stand against the wall. And he can decide if I can enter Al-Aqsa or not. This is the pain of Al-Aqsa under occupation. And this dua, when I make this dua with, uh, uh, in, in my sujood, and uh, my children, my youngest child, Saleh, is five years old, when I make sujood and I don't make this dua, he puts his hand on top of my head. And until I make this dua, he will lift his hand. He lift his hand. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants all of us a prayer in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa when it's free from occupation. Because under occupation, what I experienced in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, uh, we will come to uh discuss during the current the current period but it is very painful seeing women attacked inside the masjid al-aqsa while reading the quran women's hijab taken off inside the masjid al-aqsa people people being shot gas bombs people being uh injured and killed martyred inside the masjid al-aqsa if this would happen anywhere else in the world the whole world would be at arms when it happened in paris uh, in a synagogue, which is something that no one uh, accepts uh, to an attack on uh, a religious site. Uh, when, when it happened, the whole world leaders gathered in Paris and marched in solidarity. It happened in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa many times, not once or twice or three times. In 1990, there was a massacre inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa. Tens of Muslims were murdered inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa. When Ariel Sharon entered and stormed the Masjid Al-Aqsa in 2000, thousands, hundreds of Muslims were injured inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa. In 2017, when Al-Aqsa was closed for two weeks, two people were killed inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa and, and tens more outside it. This is something Al-Aqsa should not be under occupation. Al-Aqsa, according to international law, actually all of Eastern Jerusalem is under occupation and Israel has no legitimacy in that uh, area whatsoever. Uh, however, the world is complicit and does not hold Israel to account for what it is uh, doing. So what does it mean for you that Al-Aqsa is number one? Al-Aqsa is your first Qibla, is something that you really need to think about. And make this dua in your sujood uh, every day, at least once a day, at least once a day. And it's not too much to ask. And today I will be asking you to do three things. And next week, uh, next class, we will uh, ask, uh, make them a total of five things that you need to do for Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa on a daily basis. You might, tell, you might tell me, well, what does dua do? Uh, dua is not something that will make a difference on the ground. You may be half right because dua without action does not lead to anything. Allah says in the Quran, in Tansur Allah Yansurkum, if you take action, Allah will give you victory. Allah says in the Quran, in Allah la ma bi qawmin hatta ma bi anfusim. Allah will not change your status until you change it yourself. Allah will not bring down the victory of Al Aqsa Mosque. Uh, 
by a Khalifa who will come down from a parachute from the sky. Allah will not change your circumstances until you change it yourself. And the first weapon the Prophet ﷺ says, Dua is the weapon of a believer. Dua is your starting point, but it does not mean dua is dua prayer supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough. You need to take the following steps, and we will come to the following steps today, which is uh, making action through knowledge is the starting point that we will be expanding on in our discussion uh, today. So uh, uh, I will tell you a story of uh, a British, a British Pakistani who came to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa to show you the power of uh, power of Duha. He came to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in the uh, early 90s. And uh, this is this story is related to me by uh, brother Muhsin Kilbi, uh, who was a convert. He accepted Islam together with Yusuf Islam in the 80s and came to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And uh, uh, he has three exhibitions uh, on Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. He was a photographer uh, from musicians uh, like Cat Stevens at that time. And then after he accepted Islam, he uh, was taken to Mecca and Medina and he came to Al-Aqsa. And he took uh, amazing pictures of these of these places. Uh, the uh, he, he passed away uh, a year uh, uh, nine months ago. Uh, may Allah have mercy on his soul. But this story is related to me by him. He says uh, this Pakistani uh, British Muslim came to Al Masjid Al Aqsa and uh, uh, he was making du'a everywhere, and he mis he was making his du'as. Uh, loud, and he came uh, after they left Al Masjid Al Aqsa. They came to this wall, the eastern wall of Al Masjid Al Aqsa, and here the 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 bab of uh, the gate of mercy and gate gate of forgiveness, and next to it is the graves of two Sahaba, uh, Shaddad ibn Aws and uh, Ubad ibn Samit, and he makes a dua. He says, Ya Allah, I wish that my grave I am buried between these two two, two Sahaba. And many uh, people, you sometimes make dua for the impossible. And uh, you ask Allah for the impossible and Allah will make it possible. Like Allah made it possible for Zakaria or when he came into the uh, chamber of Maryam alayhi salam in the eastern uh, corner of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, uh, in this uh, corner, uh, he entered into her mihrab. Uh, as we know, it is known as the mihrab of uh, the mihrab of Maryam. The gates here are known as the gate of mihrab of Maryam, and this here is the place where uh, Maryam alayhi salam is believed to have made her i'tikaf. When Zakaria would enter her chamber, he would find that she has rizq from Allah. He is bringing her fruit, and she has everything, all the sustenance. And then he raises his hand at an old age, over eighty years old. He does not have any children. He raises his hands to Allah and asks for the impossible. He says, Ya Allah, give me a child. And he returns to his mihrab. This is mentioned in the Quran and we'll come to it. And he returns to his mihrab and Allah, the angels come to him with the glad tiding of Yahya. This brother, uh, 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 Pakistani, uh, British Muslim, uh, he, uh, at this point here, makes this dua. Ya Allah, make my grave between these two sahaba. And he, uh, they spend the rest of the time in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, and then he uh, is uh, going back from the airport. In the airport, he has a heart attack, and he's taken back to Jerusalem to Maqasid Hospital. And in the hospital, he passes away, and his children come. And his children come from the UK to take the body of their father back home. And uh, their father, uh, uh, his last wish was to be buried between the two Sahaba. And the people there said to him, uh, your father's last wish was to be buried here. And we will not allow you to take his body back to the UK. And the children insisted, the Jerusalemites the, said, we, he will be buried between these two Sahaba. 
and today his grave is between these two Sahaba. If you are truthful with Allah, Allah will be truthful with you. As long as you are truthful with Allah, you will be, He will be answering your prayers and He will fulfill it. This is exactly also the same place where Imam al Ghazali, as uh, Safwan mentions, uh, used to make his ahtikaf in Al Masjid al Aqsa. And he wrote in this area, in Al Masjid al Aqsa, he wrote uh, a book called A Risala al Qudsiya. Some people believe that he wrote Ihya Ulumuddin or part of it there, but it's believed that he wrote uh, most of it in Damascus. But he wrote in this area uh, at the gate of Rahma, he wrote this uh, book, Al Risala uh, Al Qudsiya. Uh, Al Masjid Al Aqsa is your number one priority, it is your first Qibla. You need to care about Al Masjid Al Aqsa, it needs to be your number one priority. And making this dua on a daily basis will, inshallah, جل, at least make us uh, think about Al Masjid Al Aqsa on a daily basis and make it part of our uh, part of our uh, daily practice to mention this on a daily basis. I was uh, with a group of Turkish students here in Turkey and uh, from Konya. And I mentioned to them this dua. And the following year, I met with them again uh, online. And I asked them if they are still uh, making this dua. And they said, one of all of them, alhamdulillah, are still making this dua a year later. And I ask you also to make this dua. And one of them said she makes this dua 88 times every day. In every sajda she makes, she makes this dua. If you are truthful with Allah, Allah will be truthful with you. It is up to you. Number two, actually before we come to number two, on the issue of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is your number one. One of the guards of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa said to me, Khalid, tell the Muslims. Uh, actually, he told it in a lecture and then uh, we sat and he said, tell the Muslims to make Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, to, to love Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa more than they love the Kaaba. I said, maybe this is a bit too much. Uh, the Kaaba is their Qibla. It's a spiritual hub where they face in their prayers. Uh, how can they love Al-Aqsa more than the Kaaba? He said, Khalid, ask them. If, and if they have children, uh, imagine you have three children. This is from one of the guards of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, Abu Qutayba, uh, Samir, uh, Siyam. He says, if you have three children and one of your children is terminally ill, one of your children is very ill, would you pay more attention to that child? Would you love them more? Would you sit by their bedside uh, all, uh, all, 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 all the time uh, and sometimes to the neglect of your other children until they get better? So imagine, and I have uh, one of my colleagues here, uh, his child had leukemia, he had uh, cancer, and he would spend all the time, his mother would spend all the time by the bedside of the child in the hospital and spend so much time praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this, uh, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, he's cured by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But imagine how much attention you would give to that child. He said, let them, Al-Aqsa, is terminally ill. Al-Aqsa has been under occupation today for 104 years. The British occupied Baytul Maqdis and this uh, blessed land 140, 104 years ago on the 11th of December. And today is the 12th of December. Uh, uh, 104 years yesterday, Allenby entered Al uh, Bayt al Maqdis, he entered the city of Jerusalem and he said, he proclaimed, Today the Crusades have ended. This was a crusade to the British armies. This, although the British uh, war cabinet said, Do not use crus crusading rhetoric, we see the crusading rhetoric in uh, the newspapers and in the even speech of Allenby, General Allenby, when he entered, uh, uh, entered uh, the city. 
So the guard of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is asking you to love Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa to make it number one until until it is liberated then you can love them both all at the same level uh, again but you need to pay that extra attention to al-masjid al-aqsa so this is number one and i know it's taken us an hour to discuss this but it's really important that we recreate these connections with al-masjid al-aqsa al-masjid al-aqsa is number two it's a topic that we've already discussed al-masjid al-aqsa is a second mosque on earth so i'll skip through this uh, relatively quickly we already discussed that the first mosque on earth was the kaaba and now you can see there is a twinning between al-aqsa and the kaaba let let's start al-aqsa is the first qibla the Ki the kaaba is the second qibla the uh, the kaaba is the first mosque al-aqsa is the second mosque there are only two mosques mentioned in the quran by name Al-Masjid Al-Haram and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, the Kaaba and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. No other mosque is mentioned by name in the in in the Quran. Let's get back to uh, the Kaaba. We said the Kaaba was much longer than it is uh, today, and we compared between uh, the uh, Al-Aqsa and the Kaaba, and we saw that uh, the building of Al-Aqsa and the building of the Kaaba correspond to one another. And we said a masjid does not need. Uh, uh, there are three features for a masjid, the space, the boundaries, and the qibla. And this is uh, a masjid uh, that uh, exists, for example, one of the early mosques that exists in, in Palestine uh, today. We talked about the similarities between the Kaaba and the Masjid Al-Aqsa in terms of proportion, that they are both exactly the same uh, in terms of proportion and ratios. Uh, although the Kaaba is much smaller in size, we said uh, the maximum length is 18 meters, while Al-Aqsa, the maximum is 488. The angles are exactly corresponding to one another, and the foundations of Al-Aqsa was built towards the foundation of uh, the, uh, towards the Kaaba, and between the building of both of them was 40 years, as is established in the Hadith of Bukhari. <coughs> So we see from this that the building of both Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and Al-Masjid Al-Haram happened at the same time from the time of Prophet Adam. Both these mosques were two centers of monotheism built on earth as Rasulullah has uh, told us. Al-Aqsa, like Al-Kaaba, was renovated many times and rebuilt many times by numer numerous prophets. Uh, many traditions, uh, Quranic verses and hadith tell us about the rebuilding of Ibrahim to the Kaaba. And many traditions tell us that Ibrahim also rebuilt uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Also, many other prophets have come after that, like Prophet Sulaiman, uh, who rebuilt Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And it was rebuilt during the time of Prophet Isa and Zakaria and Yahya and during the time of Prophet Maryam. Uh, sorry, during the time of uh, the mother of Isa. Maryam alayha uh, as -salam. So we see that actually most of the prophets mentioned in the Quran have uh, a direct connection with Al-Masjid uh, Al-Aqsa. Uh, we mentioned that actually a third of the Quran, actually half of the Meccan Quran, was about stories of prophets before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Who were these prophets? Isa, Yahya, Zakaria, Suleiman, Dawood, Ibrahim, uh, Ismail, all of them have a direct connection with Bayt al -Maqdis. And you will be surprised at the amount of connection between these prophets and Bayt al uh, A third of the Quran is stories of prophets. 80% uh, of the prophets mentioned in the Quran are directly related to uh, Al-Masjid uh, Al-Aqsa. Uh, just a little while earlier, I mentioned to you the story of Maryam, when Zakari would enter her mihrab. Or the story, uh, this is in Ali Imran in Medina, it was revealed, but the story of Maryam and Zakari and how Allah fulfills their dua, uh, the impossible, how Allah makes the impossible possible. This is mentioned in chapter Maryam, which is 
a chapter that is revealed in the uh, in the uh, Meccan uh, Meccan period. Not only the chapter of Maryam, also the chapter of uh, Al Anbiya, which tells us the story of Ibrahim migrating from uh, uh, from uh, his land uh, in Iraq, migrating to uh, Beit uh, Beit Al Maqdis. We know that the stories of the prophets uh, mentioned uh, in the Quran, uh, if we run through them, you find actually most of these prophets have a direct connection. Let's try to run through the Quranic stories of those who are mentioned in relation to uh, Bayt, uh, Bayt al-Maqdis. We mentioned uh, Zakaria, we mentioned uh, Yahya, we mentioned uh, Isa, we mentioned Maryam alayhi salam. These are four prophets, uh, three prophets, and the mother of a prophet at the same time. But uh, uh, Quran mentions prophets who migrated to Bayt al Maqdis. And who were these prophets? It is mentioned in Surah Al Anbiya, uh, Prophet uh, Abraham, and Prophet Lut. When in Surah Al Anbiya, verse 71, when Ajaynahu wa Lutan. And we saved him and Lut to the land which we have blessed for the whole uh, for the whole uh, world. So the Quran talks about the migration of two prophets, Prophet Ibrahim and Prophet and Prophet uh, uh, Lut to the land of Bayt al <coughs> Excuse me again. The prophets who were born, uh, my apologies, slides in Arabic, but I will run through them in English. The prophets who were born in Bayt al Maqdis. Uh, who, were, who amongst the prophets was born in the land of Bayt al Maqdis, in the Holy Land? We know Maryam was born there. We know that Isa was born there. We know that Yahya, Zakaria. We know that Suleiman was born in this land. We know that uh, the children of Ibrahim السلام, were born in this land. Ismail was born in Bayt al-Maqdis and then taken with his mother to Mecca. Ishaq was born in the land of Bayt al-Maqdis. Uh, uh, who else? Uh, Yaqub was born in the land of Bayt al-Maqdis. Many of these prophets were born in this land. And the Quran tells of their uh, birth and their stories. The story of the birth of Isa is told in a lot of detail because the birth of Isa is Surah Maryam. Uh, his birth was a miraculous birth, but the Quran tells us of the glad tiding of the birth of Yahya, the birth of Ishaq, the birth of Yaqub. All of this was also mentioned in the Quran, uh, in 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 a sense. So this is the those who were who were born there, those whom it was the center of their prophethood, and this runs through most of these prophets that we have mentioned, and even much more. Those whom it was their center, the center of their kingdom, and this applies to Prophet uh, uh, Suleiman and Dawood, and we believe them to be kings and prophets. While for Jews in the Jewish religions they were just uh, kings, and they used to commit major sins. Uh, and without going into what the uh, Old Testament says about the sins of. Uh, David or Solomon, uh, to us, they were infallible prophets. They were ma'soom and they were uh, centered and the center of the kingdom was Bayt and maqdis Those whom it was their place of their mi'atikaf and their, uh, their mihrab, like again Zakaria and Yahya and Maryam and Isa alayhi salam, and the one that was taken to this land. Uh, on the uh, night journey and led all the prophets in prayer, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Quran also does not just mention Bayt al-Maqdis in terms of the past. It also mentions Bayt al-Maqdis in the Meccan period in terms of the future. And we will discuss the Roman-Byzantine war, but also the Quran talks about it as the end of the uh, uh, mischief of the Israelites uh, their end will be on the land of Bayt al-Maqdis in the uh, first verses of Surah al-Isra, particularly verses 5 to 7. 
And also it talks about it in relation to the Day of Judgment as in Surah Qaf. The Mufassirin say this is this verse is in relation to uh, the angel blowing the trumpet from the rock of Beit al Maqdis. So the importance of this rock is not just being the Qibla of the Muslim, the first Qibla of the Muslims, but also the center of the day of judgment and the future of the day of judgment. The second thing that I would like to ask you to do is uh, um, how can we translate this uh, into our life today? What does it mean that we know it is the land of the prophets and it was our second mosque and most of the prophets were there? What does this mean to us today? Uh, and what did it mean until you, you write the answers and Amina can uh, help us here? Uh, until you write your answers, I will try to explain what it meant to the early uh, Sahaba. The early Sahaba, imagine, they are standing in prayer, facing towards Bayt al-Maqdis, in the house of Al-Arqam. And while they are inside uh, uh, the mosque of al uh, inside the house of Al-Arqam, they are reciting verses about prophets who were in the land of Bayt al-Maqdis. So imagine Al-Arqam or, uh, <coughs> or uh, Omar or uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf or uh, Abu Bakr praying towards Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and reading the story of how the impossible became possible, how the old man, uh, the old prophet uh, Zakaria was given glad tiding of a child. He would ask Allah, then Abu Bakr would ask Allah for the impossible. Uh, when the story of Maryam and how Isa alayhi salam spoke in the cradle uh, is read by uh, a, a young Sahabi like uh, Hazrat Ali, like Sayyidina Ali uh, bin Abi Talib. What would that mean to him? What would it mean to uh, the female companions, to Ruqayya, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? to Asma, uh, uh, the wife, uh, uh, the later wife of Zubair, the daughter of Abu Bakr, to uh, Sumayya, the first Shahida, uh, reading these verses and pondering over them, the land of the prophets, the land of hope. This was giving hope to the prophets. When Ibrahim was tortured uh, by his people in, uh, in Babel, in Kutha, in Iraq, Allah saved him to the land of Bayt al-Maqdis. What would this have meant to the early Sahaba who were being tortured in Mecca? How would they have seen this? Where is their uh, hope? Where is the land of hope for them? And imagine this connection with Bayt al-Maqdis. Would it become stronger or not? Uh, when Allah swears by three places, وَالتِّينِ وَالزَّيْتُونِ وَطُورِ سِينِينِ وَهَذَا الْبَلَدِ الْأَمِينِ Starting from uh, the back, Allah swears by the sacred city, by Mecca, and then by Mount Sinai uh, in, in Egypt, and then by the land of the figs and olives. And Imam ibn Kathir says, this is Allah swearing by the land of Bayt al-Maqdis. Because in Mecca, the Quran was revealed. In Mount Sinai, the Torah was revealed. But in Bayt al-Maqdis, in the land of Bayt al-Maqdis, not one book, not two books, many books and many revelations were constantly, it was the gateway to heaven, constantly revelation was coming down on Bayt al-Maqdis because it was the land of the prophets. It is the place where the Injil, the gospel came down to Isa alayhi salam, the place where the Psalms, the Zabur came down to Zaka, uh, to um, uh, Dawood alayhi salam, the place where Suhuf Ibrahim came down, did not come down in one city, but in the region of Bayt al-Maqdis. So this is why Allah swears by the land of the figs and the olives, as Imam ibn Kathir uh, puts it. <coughs> so how can we live this connection, this religious connection with this land today? Uh, did we get any answers, uh, Sister Amna? Okay, uh, until Sister Anna uh, joins us, uh, I can read some of the comments. We'll take the rest of the questions, inshallah, 
uh, later on. Uh, yes, to educate our children of the true history of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Let them feel the importance of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Let them know that this Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is their masjid. They need to care about it. These prophets are their prophets. Uh, and uh, again, from Rabah, she says to uh, keep Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa always in the hearts of the public. We have to make Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa something that we always learn about and talk about between our uh, families, between our people, and it's something that we are always uh, uh, mentioning. Uh, also, uh, Sister uh, Hanifa, to talk to talking about the virtues and create awareness on Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. These are extremely important, but make this a daily habit. Don't make it a one-off. Try to make this into a daily habit. That's something we can do on a daily basis. Uh, learn and share what you learn about Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and to bring it up in conversations with friends, to remind ourselves and educate ourselves as Boston Fox uh, 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 mentions. So these are all extremely important things that you have mentioned. And just to add to this, to wrap this uh, part up, is to uh, uh, ask you to do one thing a day. Uh, and what I would like to ask you to do on a daily basis is to read one verse or one hadith on a daily basis. We said we will make a dua every day. This dua, next to it, at least in your prayer, uh, while you are reciting, recite Surah Tatin, I remember in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Recite the first verse from Surah Al-Isra. Uh, recite something from Surah Maryam to remind you of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Make, uh, 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 make something in uh, your habit that you read something, learn something new about Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa on a daily basis. Let me tell you something that the Prophet used to do every single night before he used to go to sleep. And this is an authentic narration narrated by our mother Hajjah. She says the Prophet وسلم, will not go to sleep every night until he recites Surah Al-Isra. The Prophet, after the night journey, would not want to forget the greatness of this journey, that every night after this journey, he would recite the he would utter the name Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa on his blessed lips. He would utter the word Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa every single night before he would go to sleep. He would recite the chapter of Surah Al-Isra. I'm not asking you to do this. If you are able to do this uh, on a daily basis, then that will be great. Well and, well and good. But if you are not able to do it, then at least, uh, 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 recite that first verse and utter the words al Masjid Al Aqsa on your lips during your prayer or after your prayer uh, before you go to sleep or learn something new about al Masjid Al Aqsa. So, we've uh, agreed on two things. The first thing that we have agreed on is that we will uh, make a dua, Allahumma rizukna salatan fil Masjid Al Aqsa wa huwa hurran aziz, on a daily basis. Number two, we will, uh, inshallah, azza wa jal, uh, read something, learn something about Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa on a daily basis, uh, or at least utter uh, or recite uh, a word, uh, an ayah or hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if we're unable to do more than that. But at least make it a habit. Al-Aqsa has to become a habit into your life if we are looking to liberate Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa within our uh, lifetime. Uh, this is what it meant to the early Sahaba. It was their spiritual connection through the Qibla and the first revelation. Also, this is something I forgot to mention, that the five verses on the Barakah of this land was mentioned during the Meccan period. So in, you know, the Quran is divided into two parts. A Meccan, uh, the Meccan Quran and the Madani Quran. The Meccan Quran are the chapters that were revealed before the migration of the Prophet to uh, to Medina, and the Medina Medina is the one after that. And the Meccan Quran mentions five verses related to the barakah of this land. Uh, 
uh, we mentioned one, Allah, and we saved him and Lut to the land which we have blessed for all uh, nations. Uh, also, uh, and to Sulaiman, the fiercy wind which takes him to the land which we have blessed. And the third verse. وأورثنا القوم الذين كانوا يستضعفون مشارق الأرض ومغاربها التي باركنا فيها and we inherited the people who were persecuted the eastern and western parts of the land which we have given baraka and this is the concept of the land of baraka which we have discussed uh, uh, before if I recall uh, as Imam Al-Qurtubi says it is both Bilad al-Sham and parts of Egypt and the fourth verse, وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ وَبَيْنَ الْقُرَى الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا قُرَى ظَاهِرَةً And we place between them and the cities which we have given barakah uh, in relation to Yemen and Hijaz and to the land of barakah, uh, Bilad al-Sham and Bayt al-Maqdis. And the last verse comes in relation to the night journey that Allah says, Al-Aqsa is the center of the barakah. To Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa الذي بَارَكْنَا حَوْلَهُ Al-Aqsa is the center of the barakah for the land that surrounds it. So in terms of spiritually, uh, we have a very string, strong spiritual connection between the early Sahaba and Masjid Al-Aqsa. Religiously, it is the stories of the prophets who will come to the night journey and the virtues, uh, the, the land of the figs and olives, uh, the land of the prophets, 80% of the prophets have a direct relation with Bayt Al-Maqdis and this land being uh, housing the second mosque on earth from the time of Adam. Uh, all of this brings us to the third connection. Uh, the third is a political connection, and you will be surprised. Politics in the Quran, yes. Number three is politics. Uh, the first two, uh, spiritual, religious. Number three is politics. How, how can we, how is there politics in the Quran? The Quran actually, uh, uh, in a very difficult time, when the Sahaba were persecuted in Mecca, when they were being tortured, when Sumayya had become the first shahida, uh, when Yasser is uh, shaheed, when Ammar is in a very difficult position uh, to leave Islam, when uh, large numbers of them, over 100, have to migrate to Abyssinia because of the torture they are seeing in Mecca, the Quran is not talking about their situation, the Quran is talking about a war that the Muslims have nothing to do with. The war that took place between the Byzantines and the uh, Persians, uh, between the uh, Roman Byzantine Emperor and the Persian Sassanid Emp uh, Empire. They were at war with each other uh, at the turn of the century. But the Quran, they occupied many cities, uh, many places, uh, were taken by the Persians, most of Anatolia, most of Sy all of Syria, uh, all of Egypt, North Africa, everything fell down. But the Quran paid particular attention to this when it was in relation to Bayt al -Maqdis. This is extremely interesting. Taking the attention of the Sahaba from the political uh, sanctions and the political uh, uh, torture that they were living in Mecca to another political war that was happening between two superpowers at that time, between the Romans and the Persians. Uh, what am I to do with this, you might say? Uh, this is a war that we have nothing to do with. Uh, or as the uh, Arabs would say, لا لنا فيها ولا جمل. We do not have a camel or a she-camel in this war. We don't have any money on that. We, th this is not our war. Why should we be interested in this war? The Quran does not mention it when Damascus fell or Alexandria fell or Constant Constantinople was about to fall. The Quran mentions it when what it was Bayt al-Maqdis, in the region of Bayt al-Maqdis. Bayt al-Maqdis fell and there was uh, a war that took place around the area of the Dead Sea. And this is when the Quran uh, brings this to the attention of the early uh, Muslims. What is interesting here is think of two superpowers today. Uh, 
say, uh, America and China. America and China are fighting. And uh, you might say, what am I to do with it? Let them, in Arabic, there is a, a saying, Fukhari kasser uh, Clay, may they destroy each other. And some imams even make this dua, may Allah destroy zalim by zalim and get us out safely out of, out of their hands. But the Quran wanted to attract the attention of the Muslims to the superpowers at the time, to the international politics. Islam is not a local religion. Islam is an international religion, and you need to pay attention to international politics and what is going on, and particularly when it is to do with Bayt al -Maqdis. The Quran says, Alif Lam Mim, and these are the Huruf Muqatta, and then it says, Ghuli Batirru. But everyone knows this. The Byzantines have been defeated. But the Quran specifies where. It says, Fi Adna al -ard. And many of the modern Mufassirs have explained this. Many of the early Mufassir explain it in the area around Bayt al-Maqdis. But the, many of the modern Mufassirs say this is actually the area of the Dead Sea. Because there is actually a, 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 a miracle in this. That the lowest part of the world is actually the area of the Dead Sea. And Adna in Arabic also has the meaning of low. And this was only discovered by uh, a modern geologists in our modern time. And the Quran has mentioned this uh, 1400 years ago, that the lowest part of the earth is this, uh, this, this area. Uh, so the Quran, after specifying the place, the Quran comes against all political analysts of the time, if we may say so. A uh, political analyst of the time would say that the Byzantines have been completely defeated because they lost all their territory. If we look at the map here, uh, actually it's not very clear, but the Sasanid Empire, the Persians took all of Syria. This is uh, Beit al-Maqdis around here. They took all of North Africa. They took all of Anatolia. And what was left was just Constantinople, Istanbul today. That is what was left. Everything else was completely gone. So if I tell you that uh, China has invaded America and only Washington is left, what would your political opinion analyst, as a political analyst, what would you say? You would say this is the end of the American dream. This is the end of America and Amer America will never rise again. The Quran comes with exactly the opposite of this and he allah says within a few years they shall be victorious and the quran specifies bid ah. and bid ah in arabic means between three and ten three and ten so if i would give you news of the future let's make this a little light-hearted if i would give you uh, news of the future uh, of something that certainly will happen. And I tell you, this is certain, 100%. And I tell you, for argument's sake, this is just for uh, uh, hypothetically speaking, betting, uh, making a, a wager is not haram. Uh, would you make a bet if you have something, knowledge of the future? You might say, if it's not haram, yes, I would. Um, if I tell you that uh, the next match between Manchester United and uh, Arsenal, the score will be 3-0 because I was sitting with their managers and they, the, the, the match will be fixed. Uh, and I'm certain that this will be the results. If I tell you this and I'm certain, I'm giving you 100% information, would you make a bet on it, Amna, or would you not? Yes, logically. Yes. yes, because you're going to make a lot of money. For every thousand pound you put on it, you're going to at least have 10 times or uh, triple it or uh, make it much, much more. This is exactly what Abu Bakr Siddiq did. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him. When he heard these verses, and by the way, uh, betting uh, or making a wager in the Meccan period, it was not haram. It was made haram in the Medina period, but in the Meccan period, it was not haram. 
So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is sitting with Ubay ibn Khalaf, one of the uh, leaders of Quraysh, and they're discussing this international politics. And Abu Bakr says, uh, actually Ubay ibn Khalaf says to him, people like us have defeated people like you. We worship idols and they worship the fire. The people who worship the fire defeated people who worship God like you, the Christians, i.e. the Christians. And we will wipe you out like they have wiped them out completely. Abu Bakr Siddiq uh, got uh, passionate on this issue and he said, no, the Byzantines shall be victorious. And they get into an argument and then he says to him, then put your money where your mouth is. And Abu Bakr makes a wager. He makes a bet. He makes a bet that he places 10 young she camels against 10 of his. So he makes a bet that 10 of my she camels against 10 camels of yours, that within three years, the Romans shall be victorious. Then Abu Bakr Siddiq goes back to the Prophet wasallam and he tells him what he had done. The Prophet wasallam said to him, Abu Bakr, who said three years? He said, Allah says in the Quran, Bidah. And Bidah in Arabic is between three and ten in a few years. The Prophet وسلم, said, Al Bidah uh, Bid is not necessarily three, it could be more, it could be less than ten. Go back and change your bet. Increase your wager and increase the number of years. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, on the advice of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, goes back, increases it to a hundred red camels. You know, red camels are the best type of camels in Arabia. They are the fastest, the best for the desert. They are uh, enduring. Uh, think of putting a hundred Ferraris on this. This is what Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did. A person who has a hundred camels was considered in their time a millionaire or a billionaire in our in in our time so think abu bakr siddiq made the bet and what did this do to abu bakr siddiq abu bakr siddiq once uh, amna had you put your money on this and the match is tomorrow would you be watching the match or would you be uh, staying away i'd watch every second of it every second and you will be really excited if they're about to score a goal in the wrong direction. You will be your hand on your heart and you really, uh, uh, when they score the goals that you wanted, you will uh, scream yeah. goal uh, and you will be really excited about what, what, what is happening. And this is exactly what Abu Bakr Siddiq was saying. And Allah says this in the Quran. And on that day, the believers shall rejoice. Abu Bakr rejoiced on the day that this happened. And some of the Mufassirin say, actually, this has further ramifications because this was not just about the victory of the uh, 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 Byzantines over the Persians, but also uh, foretelling, uh, prophesizing the victory of the Muslims within also a few years after that. And you can actually see this. But what happened? Abu Bakr Siddiq, did not have Facebook or social media or Twitter or YouTube to follow what is going on. So how did Abu Bakr follow the news? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq would follow the news through the caravans that were coming from uh, Syria, from Bilad al-Sham. He would follow what is going on. Each caravan that would come, Abu Bakr would go and question them. Has there been another war? Who's winning? Who's gaining more territory? Abu Bakr is following the news day by day trying to gain as much information as possible <coughs> uh, to make sure that he's going to win, to win this bet. This actually gives us the uh, last point in our discussion today, uh, which is how can we today follow what is happening? Uh, betting is haram today, so you can't put your money uh, on this. Uh, on when this occupation will end. If I tell you in 2022, the occupation is going to end, and I bet you uh, uh, 100 uh, gold pieces that the occupation will end uh, within next year. Before the end of 2022, there will be no more occupation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, and uh, making a bet like this, 
would make you really engaged with what is going on following the news or and, and what is what is happening we're not telling you to put money on this what i'm asking you to do is how can you get into that spirit of following what is happening in al masjid al aqsa and in bayt al maqdis on a daily basis is it possible uh, i would really appreciate if you would write this in the comments uh, how can we do it today follow what is happening uh, in al masjid al aqsa uh, and in bayt al maqdis and on Pal in palestine on a daily basis uh, at this stage just following later on we need to get to uh, another stage but we will discuss this when we discuss the medina uh, medina uh, period what we've learned between the sahaba this is not just abu bakr siddiq the rest of the sahaba are also joining in following what is happening and bringing abu bakr the news making sure abu bakr will win uh, his uh, his bet and will get the 100 camels and maybe get a share uh, out of them uh, and we will discuss this because this happens in Medina. We'll discuss it next, uh, next, 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 uh, next week. But this brings us to a very strong connection between the early Muslims and the uh, Sahaba uh, uh, in Mecca, uh, right from the beginning of the Prophethood. It was the first Qibla, uh, the Quran, the Quranic stories of the Prophet. Uh, 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 shed light on the importance, the religious importance of this place. And coming to the last point, it becomes uh, a political, they're following the political development of what is happening in, 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 that, uh, in, in, in that land. Is there any uh, comments on this? How can we, uh, uh, Sister Anna, is there any, anyone uh, uh, with any answers? How can we follow what is happening in Beit al Maqdis on a daily basis? Is it possible? Um, no one has put in any answers but I would answer that myself yes um, please obviously we don't need to go and watch the caravans we have social media yes which keeps us up to date yes yes exactly thank you thank you so much Anna for uh, for, for that yes uh, social media uh, the people uh, today, thanks to technology, although it censors everything to do with Palestine, and you saw how Instagram and Facebook and uh, other social media uh, banned hashtag Al Aqsa uh, on the 28th of Ramadan last year when there was attacks on Al Masjid uh, Al Aqsa. Uh, so you saw that they were actually. Uh, uh, censoring this, but people are still using the social media as a means to uh, transform or to keep you informed of what is happening inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa on a daily basis. Uh, there are many social media websites uh, that inform you live from Al Masjid Al-Aqsa, from the prayers, from the clashes, from Sheikh Jarrah, from the whole uh, region of what is happening in uh, uh, in uh, in in a daily uh, in a daily basis so it is something that we need to uh, thank you amna for this it is something that we need to do on a daily basis to try to follow the news of bayt al maqdis on uh, a daily basis and try to understand what is uh, uh, what is uh, uh, happening uh, inside um, Beit al Maqdis and how the Jerusalemites are resisting the uh, occupation on behalf of the whole of the uh, Muslim Ummah. The last topic that I would like to conclude with uh, today is the uh, night journey. And this will conclude our, uh, uh, our uh, discussion today. Uh, the night journey came at a time when uh, already there was a very strong connection between uh, uh, between uh, the early Muslims in 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 Mecca and uh, in uh, Beit al Maqdis. Uh, they were already connected to this place, and uh, after this, and at a very difficult time in the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When Muhammad had just gone through three years 
of boycott. You know what that meant to the Prophet ﷺ? It meant the worst and most difficult years uh, being not allowed food or water, seeing young children starve, seeing young children and people eating the leaves of the trees. And if you know Mecca, it's a desert. The leaves of, leaves of th trees are like thorns. Uh, one Sahaba says that he uh, went to urinate uh, at night and, uh, and he urinated over something. He heard something. He picked it up and it was a dry piece of meat. He cleaned it and ate from it for three continuous days. This was the situation of the Muslims in Mecca, in a very difficult, dire situation. Boycotted for three years, and at the end of this boycott, actually we can talk about the boycott in a lot of detail, but we can leave it to the question and answer if we have time for that, inshallah. But let me speed up in this last connection. Uh, the Prophet wasallam came out of this boycott exhausted, our beloved mother, uh, Khadija, the wife of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, passed away soon after. She was a very rich woman. She was not able to even buy with her money the food because it was being blocked. Uh, his uncle, Abu Talib, who had supported him throughout all the years, uh, is on his deathbed. The Prophet is begging him to say, La ilaha illallah. And Abu Jahl enters and says, you shall not leave the religion of your fathers and your forefathers. And uh, the uncle of the Prophet وسلم, dies on Jahiriya. The Prophet is extremely upset. And this year is known as the year of sorrow because the Prophet was really saddened. The Prophet was heartbroken in this year. The Prophet, the people of Mecca, uh, the Prophet وسلم, says, Quraysh did not hurt me until Abu Talib died. When Abu Talib died, the hurting of the Prophet وسلم, went tenfold. Uh, they started uh, hurting the Prophet and attacking him and insulting him in a level that they, they have not done ever before. And this takes us to uh, the Prophet walking out of Mecca on his bare foot together with his adopted son, Zayd, Ibn Muhammad, he was known at that time, they walked for 80 kilometers to the city of Taif. 80 kilometers, it takes you two days to walk. The Prophet walked there, spent 10 days inviting the people to Islam, and all of them accepted Islam, unfortunately not. They rejected Islam, and they stoned the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, until his blessed feet bled. On that day, the Prophet had not cried like he cried to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day. He says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his feet, blessed feet, full of blood, he says, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka ba'fa quwwati. This dua is the dua of the ummah today. Oh Allah, I complain to you the weakness uh, I am in. Wa qilla tahilati. And the very little I am able to do. Aw hawani ala nas. And the humiliation I am receiving from people. Ya Arham Ar-Rahimina wa Ya Rabb al Mustadhafin, O Most Merciful, O Lord of the Weak, who are you leaving me to? Ila man takiluni. The words of the Prophet are extremely powerful. Who are you leaving me to? To my relatives, meaning the Meccans, who have control and charge over my affairs, or to foreigners who are humiliating me and stoning me. This is the cry of Muhammad on that day. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, immediately Jibreel comes to him and he says, Allah has heard your cry and Allah has sent with me the angel of the mountains. If you wish, he will squash them. He will crush them between, uh, he will lift the mountain and crush, the, crush it on top of them. If you wish that to be so. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the, angel, the, the messenger of mercy said, no, maybe their children, one of their children of their offsprings will say la ilaha illallah. Muhammad was a mercy to mankind. Had he wished, he would have taken his revenge. 
But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was not a messenger of revenge, he was a messenger of mercy. For this, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam walks back to Mecca. And on the gates of Mecca, the people of Mecca block him from entering the city. They say that you have ashamed us by going to Ta'if. You shall never enter Mecca and you shall never preach in Mecca. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stays outside the borders of Mecca until a man, uh, a man, I forgot his name just now, he comes to the messenger and he says to Rasulullah Mutaim ibn Adi, he comes to the messenger and he says, Ya Rasul, he says, uh, Muhammad, someone like you should not be stranded outside his hometown. You shall enter under my protection with the condition of not preaching Islam. The Prophet enters his city without he being able to preach Islam. This was the condition. The Prophet is heartbroken. The Prophet is hurt. The Prophet is in the worst day of his life because our mother Aisha asks him after uh, Uhud, when his uncle Hamza was killed, she says, is this not the, the worst day of your life? He said, no, the worst day was in a ta'if when I was alone and I was stoned. And uh, uh, this was the worst day of my life. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is broken, but hope will come to him with Jibreel Alayhi Salam taking him from Mecca to a place the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loves to a place the Prophet has been praying towards for 10 years, to a place that the Prophet ﷺ is already connected with. The, uh, he takes him to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa at that time looked like this. It was an empty space. The walls of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa existed. We know this, so the foundations of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, it was in ruins, but it was the, the definition of Al-Masjid, if you may recall, we know this from the Madaba, mosaic map from the 6th century. This is what the city of Elia, uh, Jerusalem, looked like at that time. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tied his burak, enters Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. At that time, there, these buildings did not exist, just the walls of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. He enters Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, prays to Raqqa and then uh, uh, he ascends to the heaven we have the Dome of Mi'raj next to the Dome of the Rock, uh, the Dome of Ascension. Uh, actually, the same rock extends underneath the Dome of Ascension, the, the, the same one underneath the Dome of the Rock, because as we said, the rock actually extends underneath the whole of the Masjid. And we said what the definition of a Masjid is. Uh, so in that sense, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa was a Masjid, even without the buildings. It had the space, the uh, boundaries, and it had also the sense uh, that we see uh, in the idea of that. This is what the city looked like at that time. Uh, the church of the Holy Sepulchre, the near church and the Masjid Al-Aqsa, the walls were there and the rock was apparent in the middle of the, uh, of the Masjid. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came inside the Masjid Al-Aqsa, prayed his two rakah, and then ascended to uh, heaven. Uh, without going into the ascension, you can read on it. He received the gift of the five daily prayers from Muslims. He came down to Al Masjid Al Aqsa, and Al Masjid Al Aqsa is full of prophets. From Adam alayhi salam all the way to Isa, all of them Allah has brought back to life for Prophet Muhammad for a once in a lifetime summit. All of them have gathered inside Al Masjid Al Aqsa, waiting for the leader, for the imam to lead prayer. Who was going to be the imam? The father of prophets, uh, Ibrahim, or the father of humanity, or the second Adam, or the second father, uh, Noah? Who was or the, Who is going to be the leader of the prophets? The leader of the prophets, the imam of the prophets, was going to be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Jibreel takes him uh, to the front of the masjid, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam leads the, five, the first of the five daily prayers inside the Masjid al-Aqsa. He prays the two rak'ah and behind him 124,000 prophets. You might say, was this a spiritual con uh, uh, connection, religious connection, or was it a political connection? Actually, this was the three of them all together. Uh, 
Um, how is it the three of them together? Uh, you understand the spiritual and religious part, but scholars like uh, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, Qaradawi, uh, modern scholars, all of them say actually this was a political summit where all the prophets handed over the leadership of humanity, the flag of leadership of humanity to the Ummah of Muhammad and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took this in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. So the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took the flag of leadership of humanity inside Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and it was, this is why we understand when we lose Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa the Ummah becomes the lowest of the low. When Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is in our hands, the Ummah is always at the top of civilization. For us to revive this and to bring back uh, uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa does not just mean the liberation uh, of Palestine. It means the liberation of the whole of the Muslim Ummah. And the Prophet Sallallahu has shown us the way uh, for this. Uh, my apologies today, I have gone over time. There was other hadith that I wanted to share with you about the night journey, but we've nearly been going on for an hour and 50 minutes and my voice is completely gone. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari uh, mentions that he was taken to Bayt al-Maqdis. He prayed with the Anbiya. Uh, he, and he came to Bayt al-Maqdis. Then he tied his uh, buraq to the uh, uh, ring where the other prophets used to tie their burak. Then he entered the masjid. He prayed to Raka. Then Jibreel came to him. Then he ascended to the heavens. And then when he comes back to Mecca, the prophet tells us, retells the story that the people of Mecca disbelieved him. Some people say this was a journey by the soul of the prophet. It was not. Allah says in the Quran, Subhanallah, Asra bi Abdiha, Muhammad was taken physically from Mecca to uh, Bayt al-Maqdis. You might say at that time, there was no airplanes. Yes, there was no airplanes, but there was uh, the Burak that Allah took him, uh, or as we uh, lightheartedly say, Burak Airways uh, was taking Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Mecca to Bayt al-Maqdis at the speed of light, better than what we have uh, even, uh, even today. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a second miracle that happened to him when the people of Mecca disbelieved him. Why would they disbelieve him if he said, I just had a dream, I went to Jerusalem and I came back? They disbelieved him. Uh, so Allah raised Bayt al Maqdis for him and he was able to see Bayt al Maqdis again and tell, 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 the, tell, tell the people of Mecca of the city of Jerusalem, the city of Elia, of what it looks like uh, because Muhammad had never visited it before. And they said, for the description, he has really told the truth. Today, we have discussed the spiritual, religious, political, and one, two, three. And we also discussed them all in one in the night journey. Uh, next week, next class, inshallah, azawajal, we will discuss the Medina period and what happened during the uh, Medina period and how the uh, early Sahaba were connected to Bayt al maqdis after their migration to Medina. We started discussing this today, but we will try to complete this uh, next week, inshallah, Azawajal. Uh, I'm not sure, Anna, if we have time for questions, or shall we leave the questions for next week? It's up to you. Uh, Anna, if you are with us. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't think we can answer any questions today, as we don't have enough time. And obviously, Doctor, you're a bit tired as well. Yes. Uh, so Okay. Maybe we could answer them in the coming sessions or yes. we can have yes. a separate Q&A session for this. Yes, that, that will be great. Maybe we can start the next session with the questions and then move on to the discussion. Uh, yeah. That would be a good idea. But if you yeah. allow me just to uh, conclude, then to wrap up the discussion in uh, yeah. two, two, three sentences. Uh, what we've learned today is something that we need to practice in our life. And next class, that will be the first thing that I shall ask you. Uh, if you have been keeping over the last two weeks, continuously making the dua for Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, oh Allah grant us a prayer in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa free from occupation, number one. 
Number two, to read a hadith or a verse from the Quran or learn something from the history of Bayt al-Maqdis on a daily basis, excuse me. Uh, why I'm saying one dua, one hadith, one ayah, because the Prophet وسلم, has said, Qalilun da'im, little and continuous is better than something big that is not continuous. It is better to keep at a base. Uh, so do it on a daily basis, even if it's small, that will get you psychologically motivated to do more in the future. But at this stage, if you are able to do more, to read the whole of Surah Al-Isra every night and to fulfill the sunnah of the Prophet then well, well and good and do it. But if you can't, at least do one verse, one hadith or one page of the history of Salah al-Din or Bayt al-Maqdis or the Fath or Umar ibn Khattab, at least do so or something a day. So a dua every day, uh, new information every day, and thirdly, follow social media of what is going in Bayt al-Maqdis on a daily basis. So then we can next week take this to the next level, uh, the way the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam took the Sahaba to the next level in their connection with Bayt al-Maqdis. Thank you very much for listening so attentively. I know the numbers haven't dropped throughout the session. I'm really grateful to you for your patience. And thank you very much for uh, your questions. And inshallah, we can try to answer them at the beginning of next session by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you, Amnan. Back to you. Zakallah <coughs> khairan, doctor, for today's lectures. And may Allah reward you and grant you shifa. And Inshallah, we'll see everyone in two weeks' time. Inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, can I just mention one more thing? Yeah. There is a conference uh, online this Friday, uh, the future of Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Uh, the opening session will be Engli in English. The rest of the conference will be in Turkish and in Arabic. Uh, I really recommend that uh, you attend this conference. Uh, you can find the details of it on uh, uh, the website of uh, uh, the University of Mardin, or you can also find it on the uh, website of uh, 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 the Islamic Jerusalem Research Academy, uh, israwaqfid.org slash conference. Uh, I would really, uh, you can register and join the uh, uh, conference through uh, the link. And uh, I'm sure you will learn something because it's talking about the future of Bayt al-Maqdis, the future of Al-Aqsa Mosque from Quranic Hadith and also from political and other uh, perspectives. Uh, I'm glad I remembered in the last minute before uh, you were going to conclude and my apologies again. Uh, for uh, extending the uh, session. Uh, no problem. No problem. Inshallah, we'll all make an effort to attend and we'll post the link um, on the group chats, inshallah. inshallah. Um, thank you once again. And assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah.